All right, let's take a look at the book of Ephesians. I have to confess, I'm doing something a little different here today, so you'll bear with me, because as I get older, my arm gets shorter, it seems. It's not long enough, and I'm reading from a different translation. It's not a giant print one, but my Bible that I usually preach from is so marked up in the book of Ephesians from years ago with ink and highlighter that I had to start over because I, I needed a fresh look at Ephesians. And so I'm reading to you today from the New English translation, the Net Bible. And the print's a little smaller, but with your help, we'll get through it, right? With your patience. Paul is writing to the Ephesians. You may remember something from the book of Acts as we went through the book of Acts together. You may remember that Ephesians is this city that was a rich port city. Kevin, Jamie, I believe you were there recently, right? Yeah. So Ephesus is this incredibly rich city from ancient times, and Ephesus was known for something special. It was the hometown, so to speak, or the seat of the goddess Diana or Artemis. Remember the riot that broke out because Paul was preaching there and the silversmiths who were crafting these idols for the temple uh, was there and people would buy the idols and take them home to their Their livelihood was threatened because of Paul's preaching. And so Ephesus had this, all this history. Paul's writing to them now. He had established a church in the seat of paganism. As a matter of fact, there were also a lot of people there who believed in magic. And we read in Acts, if you recall, that so many people brought their magic books after they were converted. They had this huge, big bonfire of magic books, and it was worth millions. They were just burned out there. This is what the history is for this church. There's two cultures striving here against each other. There is the culture of paganism and magic versus this new culture that was created when the gospel was brought by Paul. So with that background, we look here at Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Most certainly written while Paul was imprisoned in Rome. Missy and I recently had the opportunity to stand in the very spot where we believe Paul was in prison. We were down in that prison and to imagine what it would have been like for him in this place, and he wrote several letters from Rome. He begins with this salutation, this greeting from Paul. By the way, when, when letters were written, they usually were not uh, sent with a mailing return address, right? And so they started by saying who it was from and who it was to with the greetings. And so letters being read out loud, you needed to know that right away. Who's the writer? From Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he begins. He's Paul, and who is he? He's an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. If you read the book of Galatians, you notice that in the first chapter of Galatians, Paul spends some time establishing his credentials. People had been saying, well, he didn't really walk with Jesus. He's not one of the real apostles, and therefore he doesn't have the same authority as they do. And so we don't take his writings as seriously. Paul said, no way. I met Jesus on the road to Damascus. I have been called as an apostle, just like them, by the authority and by the will of God. And so he starts out by saying, listen, I'm writing to you by God's authority. These aren't his own ideas that he's sharing. He didn't make this stuff up. This is inspired from God. An apostle. Apostles, by the way, were sent as messengers or agents with all the authority. Remember, Paul had been an apostle before he met Christ, right? Do you remember that? He was not an apostle of Christ, but he was an apostle, right? He was sent as an agent with all authority by the Sanhedrin Council. He was sent to go round up Christians. And he remember he was there when they were stoned. He wanted them killed. So he came with the authority of the Jewish leaders to different places. So he knows what it means to be an apostle. It was the same idea, the same word used by the Jewish leaders. But now he says, I'm an apostle for Christ Jesus. And I come with a message and a mission by his authority. How is it so that he's an apostle? It is by the will of God. He didn't choose it. 
You think Paul would choose a life for his own making this up, for his own desire, in which he's imprisoned, beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, left for death, for dead. All of this he experienced because he was an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And he's writing to the saints, it says. Now, I know you may think a saint is somebody who uh, has been uh, given that honor by some ecclesiastical body, and we call them a saint because they lived such a perfect, holy life. Not according to Scripture, though, right? You read in Scripture, the saints are whom? The believers. We are the saints. Saints are simply those who are set apart for God's holy purposes. That's what the word means in Greek. The set apart. So you are set apart for God's holy purpose. Now listen, this is significant. Because didn't God call his people in the Old Testament to be set apart? We read it in Exodus 19. If you will be obedient to me, you'll be my own special people among the nations. They were set apart and distinct from the other nations. Now God is saying, you too, through the Apostle Paul, he's speaking to them. You who are believers in Ephesus, you're also part of that special group of people that God called. And we're going to talk more about that because it's not like God said, well, I favor you over others. They were called, and their calling included ministry and service, okay? Not just special favor. So these are the saints in Ephesus. Now, in my Bible, in Ephesus is in brackets. Yours may have a footnote because the earliest and, and uh, best Greek manuscripts available don't have in Ephesus. It just says to the saints. Why would it say in Ephesus in later manuscripts? Probably when Paul wrote this, like other letters often, it was to be circulated among several churches. It was a letter to many churches. As a matter of fact, some people have even suggested Paul didn't write this because in all his letters, he mentions people by name that he knows individually. He spent more time in Ephesus than any other one location. He stayed there for almost three years, as revealed to us in the book of Acts. So why didn't he address people by name? Well, he was probably not just writing to the Ephesians. And by the way, rather than... Uh, start listing some people and leaving others out. The church had grown considerably in the time since he had left. So he doesn't know all of the believers, and he writes in a generic sense. If anything, we notice that Ephesians is not a letter to a church in particular, like the church in Ephesus. Ephesians speaks in broad universal times to the church, which is God's people, in these broad universal terms. In other words, it's speaking to us, the church of God throughout all earth, even includes in heaven. And so when we see this theme developing in the book of Ephesians, we realize this is a letter to the church, universal. And these themes are for all of us. Um, it, pr it probably uh, became known then that it was, it was centered around the region of Ephesus, and so that found its way into the uh, Greek documents. Let me just say that if you'll notice, um, you could look at um, Colossians 4, 16. Take a look, because Paul wrote these letters together. And look what he says in Colossians 4, 16. He says, and after you have read this letter, this is a letter of Colossians, both were taken to the believers by Tychicus or Tychicus, after you have read this letter, have it read to the church of Laodicea. So the letter to the Colossians was also to be read by the Laodiceans. He wanted them to hear the message as well. And then he says, in turn, read the letter from Laodicea as well. Well, we don't have a copy of that letter. Somehow those manuscripts didn't survive, and we don't know what he wrote to the Laodiceans. But Paul is saying to the Colossians, I want you to share your letter with the church in Laodicea. And then, by the way, ask them to share their letter with you because it's for all of you. And in the same way, the Ephesians letter was written to be shared with others. Okay, we could spend more time on that, but the point is that this letter was not just for the church in Ephesus. It's to the saints, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now that in Christ motif will be developed. Paul talks a lot about what it means to be in Christ. The faithful in Christ. And throughout his letter, we'll see that. As a matter of fact, in this first section of the first chapter, we see 11 times he mentions this in Christ. And he talks about 
certain conditions of God's people from the Old Testament and applies them to the new believers who are in Christ. In other words, everything that God's people were to have in Abraham as the, uh, the covenant people, now they can have in Christ as his new covenant people, the church. The faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace. Uh, grace was a typical greeting among Greeks, Romans, Greek-speaking people. Grace. Peace was the greeting among Jewish people. Shalom in the Hebrew language. Now, shalom doesn't just mean peace like we use the word. Shalom meant well-being, health, contentment, everything that you can imagine where you feel settled. It's like the sheep who's saying, the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. I don't need anything. I am well in every way. I have shalom, peace. So when Paul says grace and peace to you, and it's from God we're going to see later, he's speaking to Gentiles and Hebrews in their language, and they come together. Grace and peace are a double blessing for God's people. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. If God is your Father, then you are one family. And one of the important themes in the book of Ephesians is that God wants us to understand we are united in Christ. A united body, a united people. He's broken down that middle wall of partition between Jews and Greeks. We are together his people. It says from God the Father, but then he adds, and the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, if the blessing is coming from God and from Jesus, he's putting Jesus on equal footing with the Father. He's establishing that Jesus is God, and the blessing comes from him. All right, let's go on. Now, I want want you to take a look at this. Verse 3, put your finger there, and look ahead. Your Bible may have divisions, uh, sections, and it probably goes down to verse 14. So just before verse 15, you notice that whole section. Do you realize that that's one long sentence in Greek? It's just like Paul couldn't even take a breath. He was spilling out so much praise for God in this next section that he doesn't even slow down and take a breath. It's all just... Our English translations break it up because otherwise we just wouldn't get it. It's it's hard to comprehend. Uh, Some translators have seen, I've never seen such a monster of a sentence ever in the Greek language. Some call it a mess. And others call it this incredible work of art that Paul wove it all together, all these ideas, into one sentence as if he couldn't contain all of his praise. He had to get it all out in one sentence. So let's try to take it on. You ready? Beginning at verse 1, um, verse 3. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. Speaking of heavenly realms, Paul is alluding to something important for his hearers. Remember, I told you they believed in magic. They believed in spirits. They believed in sorcery. They were in a a pagan society. And so they believed in one of the keys in magic, in ancient magic, was being able to know the name of a demon or a spirit. Because if you could know its name, you could control it, or at least have power and authority over it. And so when it says that... um, in heavenly realms, they believed that, you know, sometimes they were affected by spiritual beings in heavenly realms. There were three levels of heaven, or in some views of an ancient, uh, in the ancient world, seven levels of heaven. We just think of heaven as out there. But it was talking about the area in the atmosphere around earth and so on, going out from there. So the spiritual realms in which this activity took place, and we could be affected by that. It's almost like spirit worshipers in some tribes today who are still animistic spirit worshipers. They feared that their lives might be controlled or directed by spiritual beings. No wonder then that Christ is the name above all names so that they don't need to fear. Um, But Jesus gives us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. For he chose us in Christ 
before the foundation of the world, that we may be holy and unblemished in his sight. Just pause for a moment with me. I wanted to say something else about the heavenly realms. They also were uh, believing that the heavenly bodies had some impact upon their lives. Today we call it astrology. And may I just say, if any of you are wasting your time reading your horoscope, or when you meet people and you say, oh, I'm Capricorn, what are you, Sagittarius? Will you please just move beyond that silliness? Can I challenge you to do it? The crazy idea that somehow our lives are directed by heavenly bodies and that we would waste our time reading horoscopes to de decide how our day is going to be. This is ludicrous. This is what they did, by the way, in ancient Ephesus. And Paul has a message for those people. Guess what? The one who created the heavenly bodies has a plan for your life. And you don't need to worry about trying to figure out the alignment of the planets anymore. Just get yourself aligned with the creator of the planets. For he chose us in Christ. Remember, Israel was chosen in Abraham. Because God chose Abraham, and Israel was the nation that grew out of Abraham, they were chosen because God chose Abraham. Now, you are chosen in Christ. So for a Jew, all they had to do was be in Abraham. How do you be in Abraham? You're born through his bloodline. How do you be in Christ in order to have the blessings that God wants to give you in Christ? Also through the blood. Not through the bloodline, but you are born again when you claim the gift of salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for you. Now you're in Christ, and guess what? You're the new Israel, and all the blessings of Israel are yours. Every promise to Abraham, Paul says, is yes in Christ for you. All right? So in Christ, he chose us before the foundation of the world. In other words, God had this plan long ago. It wasn't like he just said, okay, I got, he's scratching his head and saying, man, I got to do something now. Adam and Eve just chose to eat the forbidden fruit. And he's caught surprised, like, uh-oh, what do I do now? No, that's not the picture at all. God had a plan from the beginning. He has a plan for you, and you don't need to look to the planets or fear evil spirits directing your life. You look to the one who created you and created everything, and you say, what is your plan? And it's revealed in Scripture. All right. He did this. Uh, he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we may be holy and unblemished in his sight. He didn't choose you just because he says, well, I like you and I'd like to spend eternity with you and, and I like you better than somebody else. No, he chooses people, all people. He wants for them to be holy and unblemished in his sight. Now, your Bible probably says in love at the end of that sentence, right? Because verse 4 goes to includes those words in love. You remember that uh, in the 16th century, some monk was riding along on a cobblestone street in a, in a wagon, and wherever his pen happened to hit the page, that's where he put the verse marks. That's what it seems like sometimes, right? It doesn't always make sense. That's not how it worked. But sometimes the verse divisions, remember, they weren't there when Paul wrote it, and they're not always at the best spot. And so try to read your Bible sometime, ignoring those verse divisions, and the way I would read this is um, that we may be holy and unblemished in his sight. Stop right there. End of, end of that thought, not the end of the sentence, because we know this is Paul's big sentence. That could be a comma there. And then, in love goes along with the next phrase. In love he did this. Why did he do this? Why did he choose us in Christ? Because he loves us. In love he did this by predestining, uh-oh, there's that word, predestination. It's a hot topic among Christians. It's a biblical truth. But people don't always understand it in a biblical sense, right? We are predestined by God for salvation. He wants everyone to be saved. What's so hard to understand about that? God's plan from the beginning is, you are mine. I have redeemed you in Christ. Christ died for all, not for some that he chose and others will be left out. See, the, the one view of predestination is that God chose some for salvation and some for damnation. Already determined, predestined. But the Bible says, if Jesus says, if anyone comes to me, I will in no way cast him out, right? 
The choice is ours to accept what God has already predestined for us. In other words, God has a destiny in mind for you. It was chosen before you were even born. He wants to have you be his whole, part of his holy people, unblemished in his sight. Okay, let's pick up reading there again. Um, by predestining us to adoption as his sons. Now, does that exclude the ladies? Not at all. But ladies, I have good news for you. Biblically, you're considered a son. And you may say, well, what's so good about that? Well, because in Bible times and in Bible culture, the daughters didn't receive anything. You know, they were dependent on their husband that they would marry for an inheritance. Sons got the inheritance. And so when God calls you his son, ladies, and that's the word that's used, not child, it means you are included in the adoption. Male or female doesn't matter. You're one of God's kids who gets adopted into the family and receives the blessings. You can say amen, ladies. It's, it's good news for you, okay? Don't be offended. He adopted us as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, that he has freely bestowed upon on us in his dearly loved Son. In him we have redemption. Notice present tense. Okay, so first it talks about what God already did in the past. He predestined us. He chose us in the past. Now, Paul moves to the present. In him, and this is one of those 11 times when it says in Christ, in him, or in whom, in this little section between verses 3 and 14, 11 times he's talking about all the blessings we have and who we are in Christ. In him, we have redemption. I'll never forget the little old lady in the hospital bed facing death as cancer was destroying her body. And I asked her, Sister, are you, are you ready for this? She said, I hope so. I asked her, do you, are you, do you know that you have salvation in Jesus? I hope so. I hope so. There's no hope in I hope so, right? You don't want to come to the end of your life and walking with Jesus as long as she did and saying, I hope I've been good enough. I hope God loves me enough to save me. It's not like that at all. And I took her to several verses in Scripture where, where we cross over from life, in, from death into life, John says, right? We have life if we have the Son. We have eternal life. And Paul is saying here, we have redemption. Please, don't leave here today wondering if you're good enough to be saved. Let me answer the question for you. You're not. The good news is he saves us be, even though we're not good enough, right? Who's good enough? Jesus is good enough. And in Christ, we are saved. In Christ, not in ourselves. That's the good news. Hey, when you know that, you can walk out with your head up and a smile on your face because there's something good that you just figured out. And you can share it with other people. I have redemption. Not, I hope so. I don't want to go to my last breath with an I hope so mentality. We can say confidently like Paul, <laughs> I've finished the race. I've fought the fight, the good fight. I know there's laid up for me a crown. We have redemption in him. Through his blood, by grace you have been saved, Paul will say in the next chapter, right? By grace you have been saved through faith, okay? So through his blood we have redemption, the forgiveness of our trespasses. By the way, God saved Israel for the glory of his grace. That's what he was doing in the Old Testament. He stated that. How? When did they get their redemption? They were slaves in Egypt. Redemption refers to buying someone out of slavery paying a ransom for them. They were redeemed from the slavery of Egypt at Passover time, the first Passover, right? The blood was important, the blood of the, the slain animal. How are you and I redeemed? We're redeemed from sin, not from Satan. We're redeemed from sin, because Satan doesn't own us. Amen. We are redeemed from sin. We have redemption from sin, how? Through the blood. How? 
of Jesus, just like at Passover in Egypt. And we are to be his holy people. And by the way, we're, I'm jumping ahead, but we're going to see that there's a promised redemption. God promised his people the promised land. They were redeemed, and then there's a promise for them, the promised land. And the promised land was actually more like just a down payment because they understood, as Jesus versed it, the meek shall inherit the earth, right? They understood that one day they believed God would give them the whole earth. It's a down payment. And Paul takes that theme up for us too because we now just have a little down payment of all the blessings that God wants to give us in fulfillment in the future. But let's, let's hold that. We'll come to it. Verse 7. Now, we finish up verse 6, that he has freely bestowed on us in his dearly loved Son. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Not because we deserve it, not according to our goodness, but the richness of his grace. Because of his kindness and his unmerited favor toward us. That's why we have this forgiveness. Verse 9, uh, verse 8 that he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, he did this. Again, put that phrase together from the beginning of verse 9. It goes along with this. He did this in all wisdom and insight. So God is wise, and he had divine insight. He saw what he had planned, and he did this according to his wisdom and his great plan for us. When he revealed to us the secret, if you're following our Facebook page, you know, the trivia question was, what is the secret of God that he revealed? And we think of secret as something that you're holding back and don't want others to know. In the Bible, secret, or the word mysturian in, in Greek means mystery. It's something that's not yet revealed. Okay? So what is this thing that hasn't been revealed yet? When he revealed to us the secret of his will. See, now we understand his will. He's, re he's letting us take a little peek. It's like God has this masterpiece He's working on it. It's draped. It's veiled. And he says, take a peek behind the veil and just see what's going on. It hasn't fully been unveiled yet. That will happen at the consummation of all things, at the end of time, in the fullness of time when God puts everything on heaven and earth under Christ, is what Paul's telling us here in Ephesians. But take a peek right now and you begin to see what his will is, what his plan is, that that's what he's up to, that one day we'll see Christ as the head of all in the universe. He revealed to us the secret of his will according to the, his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ toward the administration of the fullness of times. In other words, the administration has to do with managing, being a steward. God is a good steward of the universe. He's the manager. He's in control. He's controlling the times. And at the right time, everything is going to fit together toward the administration of the fullness of times to head up all things in Christ. Your Bible might say something about to unite all in Christ. But the, the word head is actually there in the Greek word. It's, it's uh, the root of that word. And it has to do with Christ being the head over a united body. And so he will head up all things in the end. When Christ is head of all and when every knee bows to him. The things in heaven and the things on earth. In Christ, we too have been claimed. That idea there of a, of a redemption or an inheritance. Your Bible may translate it differently, but we have been claimed in Christ. In other words, God's claiming us in him. As God's own possession, remember that's from you may want to take a look at Exodus 19 real quickly with me. Exodus 19 and verse 5, just to get this idea that God had already spoken this, this kind of covenant to Israel, that they were his special possession. Exodus 19, 5 says, And now, if you will diligently listen to me and keep my covenant, then you will be my special possession out of all the nations, for all the earth is mine. And you will to be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So God chose Israel in that way. And now Paul's setting this same kind of language and setting the theme for us. That's what God wants with this new nation in Christ, all the believers. He's claiming you as his own possession. Same language. His own special treasure. 
which, uh, since we were predestined according to the one purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will. This is all, all this language is about sovereignty. So now Paul has moved on from the present to the future. This is what God is going to do in the future. Verse 12, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ. Who's the we? The Jews. The first who set their hope on Christ were the Jewish believers. We who were the first to set our hope on Christ would be the, to the praise of his glory. That phrase comes up again. We've seen that, and it comes up again at the end of verse 14. So just make a little mental note. You want to connect those. And when you, now he moves from we to you, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed in Christ, you were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. Notice that Paul is moving from we to you because he's including them as part of God's family. And he's going to go on. You were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. Marking something with a seal or branding it means I own it. So when God gives you the Holy Spirit, sometimes we think of it the wrong way. We think, I have something. Like, I got, I got a part of God here now. But God stamps you by instilling in you, he, he places in you his spirit, and now he's saying, you're mine. It's like you're stamped, you're sealed with a mark where he says, you belong to me. Verse 14, who is the down payment? Down payment there is the same word that we saw in verse 11, who have been claimed as God's own possession. Same Greek word, the down payment. Now, we often think of it, okay, God's given us a down payment, and it can go both ways. The Holy Spirit's a down payment on what we have yet to receive when the, the veil is completely removed and we see the fulfillment of all in God's plan. But think of it this way as well. God is putting a down payment on you. He's saying, I own you. I'm claiming you. And you will one day be fully in my presence. I'm claiming you for my own. He's the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own special people. And that redemption language comes up again too. Have been claimed, it's, it's the same theme, of God's own special possession to the praise of his glory. Do you realize that God's purpose then for doing all this is not like we said last week, if you remember when we looked at Ezekiel 36, God said to his people, what? I'm going to give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I'm going to do it. Why? Because I, th I think you ought to you know, just be so wonderful and, and exalt on it. Why? For his name's sake. He says, it's not for your sake I do this, Israel. I do it for my holy name's sake. And we noted that God says, I have a bigger problem than your salvation. Yes, he's interested in saving you, okay? But sometimes our limited view is that it's like salvation is between me and God. Ephesians makes it especially clear salvation is about a church. God is saving a people for himself. Don't just get narrow-minded and think it's about just me and God. God is saving a church. I do it for my holy name's sake. Because in doing that, he saves the entire universe. He deals with the sin problem, and he vindicates his name, which has been slandered by his enemy, Satan. So it's to the praise of his glory that this is all done for God's sake. And we are the beneficiaries. All these blessings are yours in Christ because you've been adopted into his family. How do we get in Christ? How does the blessing come? You see, if we try to stand our own, we're lost. But listen, in Christ means covered in his righteousness. There was a, a man who visited a shepherd who had literally thousands of sheep. And at lambing time, there were hundreds of little lambs all over the place. And while he was there visiting the, the farm, he noticed in the pastures one lamb was walking 
following another ewe across a, a lane out there in the field, and he noticed it looked like it had six legs, and part of its skin was just flapping and hanging like it had been injured and was hanging open. Now, what is this? He looked a little closer, and it was a little lamb with the skin of another lamb draped over it and tied at the bottom, which included the back legs of the, of the dead lamb. And he asked the shepherd, why? What is this about? He said, well, that little lamb's mother uh, was killed by a rattlesnake. And then this lamb was orphaned as well. And so what they did was they took, uh, there was a dead lamb. That the, she had lost her lamb also to a rattlesnake. There were two rattlesnake incidents. And so they took the lamb, the, the shepherd then takes the dead lamb, skins it, because the mother would not accept that little orphaned lamb. He tried to bring the two together. One lost its mother, one lost its little lamb. Let's put the two together. Didn't work. Because mother lamb would go sniff that little, I mean, mother you would sniff that little lamb and say, you don't smell like mine. You don't belong in this family. And she would reject that little lamb. But when the shepherd had this idea of draping the sheepskin from the other lamb that was her own over that child and then putting it in proximity again, she smelled the sheepskin of her own little lamb and said, you're mine, you belong here, and accepted that lamb and nursed it until it was on its own. In the same way, you and I are adopted into God's family when we're covered by the lamb, Jesus Christ. It's in being covered in him, in Christ, we have all these blessings, not on our own. So take some time this afternoon, read verses 3 through 14, and realize that's one big long pray sentence that Paul can hardly take a breath. He has to get it all out. He's so in love with this God who did all this in the past, predestining us and choosing us for salvation. And presently, we have redemption. And in the future, all things will be revealed and we'll have the fullness of his blessings. All of that is in the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. I invite you today to choose to be in Christ Jesus and receive all the blessings. The Father gives us the blessings. We live in those blessings in Christ Jesus.